Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm uh, Nathan Binesh, for those of you who haven't met. And uh, really excited to have you here for our eighth annual Research and Applied AI Summit. So um, to set the scene, I'll take a couple of minutes and kind of give you the context of why we're here, what we're going to try and achieve today, and uh, give you a bit of a setting of all the things that have happened in the last 10 years since we started doing these forums. So the whole purpose of this is really to kind of create a community of AI entrepreneurs, operators, researchers, um, a central place where we can share ideas, best practices, build new connections. And, oh, well, sorry. And um, the key thing is really to broach both the science and the applications of this technology. As most of you know, it's so deeply embedded in academia and in research, and connecting the two is pretty important for seeing how progress can evolve. As I mentioned, we've been doing this for about 10 years. This is just a segment of some of the companies that used to come 10 years ago. You'll notice some of these companies have become incredibly big. Some of them are the biggest companies in the world. Some of them don't exist anymore. Some of them were acquired. Uh, some of these, the founders of these businesses are here today and maybe started something new. And today, this is what the kind of cross-section of our ecosystem looks like here and across many other cities where we run events. Um, just the Cambrian explosion of businesses here is quite astonishing. And what's exciting is just the multitude of kind of applications and research areas that they're all working on. Um, this event, even though I get the privilege or the short straw to do all the introductions and moderating, which is a moderately stressful job, uh, what's even more stressful is actually running all this event and finding the venue, uh, doing all the operations, inviting all of you. And for that, I'm you know, deeply indebted to my sister Joyce, who, uh, without whom I don't think we would uh, be doing this, and I would be uh, significantly more stressed. So thank you so much for all of your time here. And also, thank you to, to our helpers. Stanley, I think, has been with us for I don't know how many years uh, and is a you know, valuable asset to our community. And my colleagues, Alex and Paula, who are also helping out. OK, so we're here basically because I think we want to create positive impact with AI technology. And uh, we want to explore the frontiers of where things are going. And um, you know, a few years ago, there was this graph that talks about technology progress. And I think it really illustrates what we're going through today. And, you know, right now, I think we're all obsessed with this day by day or week by week um, progress on benchmarks and new model drops and data set drops, et cetera. And sometimes it might look that on a week by week basis, progress is actually not that interesting or, or uh, kind of not as impactful as you might have thought. But I want to take a couple of slides just to sense check where we've been in the last 10 years and kind of make the case that actually we're in this crazy asymptote of progress. Um, you know, many years ago, DeepMind was famous for combining deep learning and reinforcement learning and uh, had many breakthroughs, whether that's Atari, AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and we'll get through uh, discussing some of these topics today. And I don't think that a couple of years later, we would have imagined that many of these similar technologies would actually be applied to very high stakes, complicated problems in the physical world, uh, namely controlling nuclear fusion reactors. Back uh, you know, in 2015, there were some of the early experiments around scaling laws. Um, this is a famous paper from Baidu's Silicon Valley AI Lab, uh, which is founded by Andrew Ng, one of the kind of OGs of deep learning. And um, in this paper, Deep Speech 2, they looked at large-scale uh, speech recognition. And if you look at the paper carefully, they argue that training um, these deep learning models end-to-end -end on lots of GPUs could lead significant scale-ups. And they showed that scale yields better performance, bigger models can absorb more data. And the kind of fun uh, historical artifacts to go through all these authors and look at where they are today. And some of them founded some of the biggest uh, AGI labs. Uh, some of them run some of the largest AI teams at you know, NVIDIA. Uh, many of them have started companies. And so these are really the kind of OG masters of scale, I would argue. And we've gone to these like small scale experiments uh, in comparison today, where we're basically running experiments at the size of CERN, uh, whether that's you know, Meta's Llama 3 or, or other models. Back a couple of years ago in the field of imaging uh, and video, if you were lucky, you got kind of grainy images that, you know, if you're uh, polite, you would say it's a sort of 16 by 16 Monet. <laughs> um, and nowadays, you get increasingly photorealism on demand. Um, this is truly astounding. 
a couple of years ago as well, when computer vision was kind of making a lot of progress, we moved into video and tried to build common sense world models. Um, there were approaches using uh, kind of complicated knowledge graphs to encode concepts about the world and how things related. Uh, there were groups, whether it's DeepMind or 20BN, trying to learn these concepts from video. And that kind of worked. And you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we have some version of the same idea, but it's basically in your pocket on demand, a uh, sort of mini version of her. Um, going back to the original Transformers paper, Attention is All You Need, one of the key uh, insights they had in the paper was that um, these language models can be useful for translation. And if you look at the paper again, they argue that it could be useful for other tasks. Now, some of the early other tasks were traditional NLP tasks like summarization, sentiment, classification, um, and this worked uh, you know, all decently well. But I don't think that a couple of years later we would have imagined that the very same techniques would be applicable to protein engineering. And going even further in protein engineering, inventing entirely no, new genome editors that we can use to correct mistakes in the body that are um, causa causal for disease. One of the other major shifts has been just the attitude of AI in, in kind of industries which has traditionally been taboo. Uh, you know, many years ago it was probably infeasible or kind of unimaginable that you would want to work in the defense industry. Uh, we had major walkouts at major technology companies uh, for refusing to work on cloud if that was going to be sold to the US government and other governments. And uh, today, defense is probably one of the hottest themes in which to apply AI because we're all aware that uh, freedom does not come for free. Um, a couple of years ago, too, we made uh, some uh, kind of collation of the big, quote unquote, funding rounds that happened for uh, language model companies. And some of the famous names that we know today collectively in one year raised about $400 million. And um, today, it's just an absolute freeding frenzy of uh, investors in Gen AI. And if you were to strip this team out of AI investing overall, we'd probably be flatter down. Um, several years ago in our State of AI report, we started to look at AI safety and alignment research and asked you know, how seriously are various labs um, taking this topic. And we enumerated the number of key contributors that we found from publications at these big labs and you know, graciously probably estimated there were about 100 people dedicated to this issue. This caused a little bit of uh, ruffle in some of these labs who argued that this data was not generous enough. Um, but you know, fast forward just two years, and we've gone from uh, kind of ethics and decision making being the big problem to now safety and existential risk and potentially dying from you know, cataclysmic AGI occurrences. Um, and now it looks like we might be swinging a little bit more to, towards the middle. So it's truly astounding how quickly progress can happen in all these different domains. Um, and you know, I hope you agree that we're still probably in, in the very early days of this technology. So the, the other big part of this event is really trying to uh, build connectivity between our speakers, um, our attendees, and there's a sort of fluid kind of interchange between the two. And I wanted to highlight a couple of the achievements of some of the uh, individuals who've spoken here in the past. So I think it was around 2019, uh, there was this fantastic paper about using deep learning for um, discovering novel anti antibiotics, uh, which is an area that uh, we desperately need a lot more innovation. Um, Jonathan Stokes was author of this paper, and his work was recently awarded one of the most impactful inventions by the New York Times. Um, last year, we had Fergo Reed, who's the VP of AI at Intercom, one of the kind of OG um, conversational products for talking to your customers. Um, he walked us through some of the best practices for building Fin, which is one of the first, um, probably one of the best um, resolution products out there for SaaS companies. They've recently doubled down their investments in AI with about $100 million. Uh, Justin Gilmer, who is one of the first authors of these adversarial uh, computer vision papers, it was famously this uh, sort of uh, like banana-shaped object that you could put on uh, kind of any image uh, that you had, and then a classifier would automatically label it as a banana. Um, and um, recently, you know, he was part of the big Gemini release. Um, Angela last year. Um, she was one of the key contributors to Llama 3, um, and uh, I hope all of you are trying to use these models and looking uh, for applications in your products. Last year we had a panel that was really fun, uh, kind of impromptu if you were there, um, and Alex Daliak from Tractable has continued to grow his business, and um, 
kind of interestingly, we had a talk from uh, Oliver Cameron, who is VP product at Cruise, and uh, has most recently announced a new project uh, where he's working on machine learning for visual effects. And one of my favorite topics is AI for medicine and healthcare. Uh, and Vivek and his team at Google Health have published uh, a series of really impressive papers around um, dialogue systems for managing patients. So um, the main thing I also want to encourage you to do is really take the time to meet other people in this room. We've got quite an extended uh, coffee and lunch break. We put a lot of time into trying to curate who is here. Um, and we've heard oftentimes of stories of finding new careers, finding collaborators, getting inspiration, starting companies, learning best practices. And uh, you know, we do this through RISE, our community events. Uh, we do this through our fellowship program, where we support open source uh, grants. So all of the capital that we raise uh, through this event, we uh, invest it back into the community. And of course, we provide early stage startup capital through Airstream. If you like this event, we run a variety of other events, whether it's in New York, SF, Boston, et cetera. Um, so we'll provide you with, with some of these links. It's a good opportunity to meet people in other ecosystems, whether it's online or, or, or in person. If you have cool ideas of projects that maybe VCs don't want to invest into, or you need a little bit of more money for your academic research, like let us know. We're happy to try and help. Um, if you're starting companies, we're interested in all sorts of different domains across AI for vertical software, dev infra, biotech, defense, uh, and have been very active in this domain. Um, over the summer, me and my team will be working on the State of AI report. So in that, uh, for that specific project, please make our lives easier by telling us about your work and uh, what topics you'd like us to cover. Um, we try and review progress on a monthly basis through our newsletter. Um, and if you're working on a university spin out, you can also ping us and we can give you some data-driven advice as to how to get a better deal from your university. And um, yeah, finally, we've wrapped all of this writing together under Air Street Press, which uh, we're kind of punching out a piece every week or so, thanks to my colleague Alex. Um, and um, you know, all this event wouldn't be possible over the long term with our longstanding partners at Cooley, for whom I'm very gracious for their support.